Stay tuned after the show today for a special promo from our friend Simone over at 90s Crime Time. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. A lot can change over the course of 40 years. Technology, communication, even human relations. But what about our commitment to justice? The Atlanta child murder shocked an entire nation into fearing a horrific, unknown monster from 1979 to 1981. Young black children were going missing from the city that represented the very epicenter of black progress in the U.S. And most of them turned up dead in horrific crime scenes, dumped like yesterday's trash. And though there have been several podcasts and television docuseries covering these events, none have dug so deeply into Atlanta's remaining historical trauma as HBO's new five-part series, Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children. We got exclusive interviews with three of the four directors, and what they discovered might well change the course of Atlanta history and reveal the hidden truth of corruption and cover-up at the highest levels of state government. The series will surely leave you wondering if Wayne Williams was the man... Count number one, causing the death of Jimmy Ray Payne by asphyxiating him with objects and by means which to the grand jury are unknown. Second count, accusing Mr. Williams of murder of Nathaniel Tatum. 23 months of murderous terror finally came to an end on June 21st, 1981, when the city of Atlanta, Georgia announced the formal arrest of 23-year-old Wayne Williams as the prime suspect in a string of 28 known murders. Williams was eventually indicted that July for the killing of two young men, 21-year-old Jimmy Ray Payne and 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater. Both of their murders had been recently added to the growing list of Atlanta's missing and murdered black children and young adults by a special joint police task force. Since most of the known 28 murder victims were young boys, the public gave the until then unnamed killer the moniker, the Atlanta Monster. But Wayne Williams was already a fixture in the public eye. He had been under near constant police surveillance since the month before when on May 22nd, he was initially detained for questioning after surveilling law enforcement academy recruits heard a loud splash underneath the James Jackson Parkway Bridge over the Chattahoochee River. Williams was driving over it at the time and appeared to have either slowed down or stopped altogether at the time the splash was heard. Authorities questioned what would ultimately bring this 23-year-old aspiring freelance photographer and talent scout to such a rural stretch of Georgia Road just before 3 o'clock in the morning. Police claimed that Williams originally told them that he was simply dumping garbage, but he would later dispute those claims, indicating that he never told police any such thing and that he was actually scouting the location of a young woman's house with whom he had a meeting later on in the morning in the next town. With no additional evidence to hold Williams, police had no choice but to let him go. And then, just two days later, the body of 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater washed ashore on the banks of the Chattahoochee River, just one mile downstream from the James Jackson Parkway Bridge. It was a discovery that would inevitably expose the dark underbelly of Atlanta's ultra-high-stakes political climate, and just how far their leadership was willing to go to put an end to this dark chapter in the city's otherwise bright history, no matter how divisive their actions would prove still nearly 40 years later. A lot has changed in Atlanta since 1979. And a lot has changed in our world since 1981 when there was a conviction for two of these murders, the conviction of Wayne Williams. On March 21st, 2019, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms holds a press conference announcing that the city is re-examining the evidence gathered from 1979 to 1981 in the Atlanta child murders cases. In attendance, a film crew and four directors with a new HBO series, Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children. It's their first taste of just how readily apparent and painful a scar the murders have left on the surviving family members of each victim and the city still to this day. So just last week during my State of the City, 
I announced that the city of Atlanta would be looking to form some type of permanent memorial to honor these children and these victims. Um, and this in large part was prompted by Mrs. Leach, who has spoken of not having a lasting memorial in which to honor her son. But also last week, I watched a national story that mentioned the arrest of a man charged with two rapes and murders based upon inputting his DNA or their DNA into a national database. I immediately reached out to Chief Shields to ask her what, if any, updated testing had we done as it relates to the missing and murdered children. Uh, Chief Shields then took the next step and spoke with our partners at the GBI, who agreed with Chief Shields that it would certainly be in order for us to now look once again at evidence that the city of Atlanta has in its possession, evidence that the GBI has in its possession, to once again take a fresh look at these cases and to determine once and for all, if there is additional evidence that may be tested that may give some peace to the extent that peace can be had in a situation like this uh, to the victim's families to let them know that we have done all that we can do to make sure that their memories are not forgotten and in the truest sense of the word to let the world know that black lives do matter. I first spoke with Emmy Award winning and Academy Award nominated director Sam Pollard on his experience hitting the ground in Atlanta to examine the missing and murdered children cases. 40 years later. I'm Sam Pollard. I'm one of the executive producers and one of the co-directors on the five-part series, The Lance is Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children. Uh, I've been involved in documentary filmmaking for over 30 years. Uh, I got involved with this project because in 2017, I had done a documentary about Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor of a major Southern city. And one of the segments I did in that documentary was about the Atlanta child murders. And uh, the company, Show of Force, is one of the producers on this series. Uh, the people at Show of Force had seen that documentary. They thought that it, it, it could have a deeper, we could do a deep, they could do a deeper exploration into the whole murders, all the murders and the aftermath. So they put together a very a huge proposal that they, we then submitted to HBO because we had all worked with HBO before. And HBO in 20, the summer of 2018 gives a green light. We would go down every month and we would spend a week in Atlanta. And we were able to interview everybody from family members, parents who had lost children to siblings, to the police, to the FBI, to the prosecutor, to the mayor of the city, Keisha Lance Bottoms. And we just really did a very deep dive. I think the hardest part for all of us, myself, Mara Chamayoff, Jeff Dupree, and Josh Bennett, the other directors, was to really have to sit down with these family members to have them relive such a horrific time in their lives. And it was very painful for many of them. I mean, if you, you know, as you saw in the first three episodes, we interviewed Anthony Terrell, who lost his brother Earl, Catherine Leach, who lost her son. We interviewed uh, Sheila Balthazar, who lost her son. So it was very painful for some of them to really sit down and relive this time in their lives. And it was hard on us to, to have to sit through it, but we felt it was a responsibility to be able to hear from them, to hear their perspectives, to hear their point of view. So it was, uh, it's, uh, I think of all the documentaries that I've done, this is probably one of the most intense that I've ever been involved with. The first episode in the series gives the viewer a uniquely high-level view of the deep racial divide still plaguing the city that was, quote, too busy to hate, and how for everything Atlanta represented in terms of black upward mobility and economic success, there too were parts of the city still deep in the throes of severe poverty and crime. Well, we thought it was important to sort of, you know, give everyone the context of what happened when these murders occurred. What was the city like? What was Atlanta? How was Atlanta? How could you see Atlanta? I was, I think I was 29 years old when the, when the murders started to happen. And I was one of these young African-Americans who had saw Atlanta as this new place to go, you know, this new beacon for, for up and coming young black folks, you know, who were coming out of college, who were looking to, to you know, as they say, move on up. And uh, so they had just elected Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor of a major southern city. He helped shape the city. He helped create that fabulous airport. You know, he was giving much more work to people of color, you know. And the city was, was you know, as people people in the north and other parts of the, of the country saw Atlanta was this new beacon. And then, but at the same time, like many cities, like many major cities, besides, you know, the, the upward spiral, the upward growth of a certain part of the black community, there was working class people, there were poor black people who were still struggling to make ends meet. And we felt that as the filmmakers, we want to give you the sense of the layering of the whole city so you understand what this city was like, how this city was growing, you know, before these murders happened and what it meant to the city, the impact it had on the city. And I think one of the things that was fascinating for us was while we were spending time down there and going to some of the shoot these interviews, we'd always ask the people we were, getting, we were in Ubers with or talking with on the streets or in restaurants, we'd tell them who we were, that we were making this documentary series. And they all either knew about the Atlanta child murders or had family members who remembered the Atlanta child murders. It really has left a scar on this city. And we wanted to really investigate it. What was really amazing though was that when we were there, you know, I think in the first week of February or March, the month of March or February, I'm not sure which, the mayor, you know, unbeknownst to us, decided to have this press conference to reopen the cases. So we immediately got a crew together, went down there. And that was really a great plus for us because it helped us really think about conceptually how to start the show, how to build the show with the mayor reopening these cases. 
the series critically examines what director Sam Pollard calls the scar, or more aptly, the remaining open wounds for those families of the remaining 23 children and young adults whose cases were subsequently closed after Wayne Williams was convicted of killing Jimmy Ray Payne and Nathaniel Cater. 23 additional cases, all suspected of having been tied to the same killer, systematically closed by the City of Atlanta and Georgia's Bureau of Investigations. The evidence, never fully examined and considered in the court of law, and the families, left with a gaping hole in their hearts where justice might well have brought them some semblance of closure or peace. I think a lot of it has to do with one of the parents, Miss Camille Bell, the mother of Yusuf Bell. And when her son, when her son died, she really became motivated to really understand. She saw the connection between the previous murders and her son's murder. And she basically put together this organization of mothers to basically put Manny Jackson and his administration's feet to the fire. You know, basically say, we don't think you've done enough in trying to solve these cases. And we're really going to challenge you to go out there and figure out how to solve these cases. That led to them creating the task force. That led to Ronald Reagan finally bringing in the FBI. I mean, these parents, particularly Camille Bell, with big motivations to get this thing up and running, to get the city really galvanized. Because a lot of people thought that, as much as I love Manny Jackson, a lot of people thought that he wasn't, and his administration wasn't doing enough in trying to figure out who the murderer or murderers were of their children. Yusuf Bell had gone missing on October 21st, 1979, after running an errand for an elderly neighbor. He was last seen getting into a blue car, and witnesses claimed that the man driving it bore a striking resemblance to Yusuf's own father and Camille's ex-husband. His body was eventually discovered in the empty E.P. Johnson Elementary School building by a janitor who was looking for an obscure place to relieve himself in the abandoned section of the property. The nine-year-old's body was discovered with a pair of brown cut-off shorts on, and nothing more. He had been hit twice in the head with a blunt object, and his cause of death was ultimately listed as asphyxiation by manual strangulation. Yusuf's mother began seeing connections in the community, how other young black boys were mysteriously disappearing, and some of them turning up dead. She eventually came together with the mothers of other victims to form the Committee to Stop Children's Murders in April of 1980, three full months before Atlanta Mayor Maynard Jackson formed a special joint task force to examine the now eight known killings, among the others who were still missing. Then, in October of that same year, the powder keg of racial tension in the city reached a critical boiling point when the Bowen Homes Daycare Center mysteriously exploded, killing five in the predominantly black, low-income part of town. The black community had finally had enough and saw the explosion as a direct, racially and economically motivated attack on their most vulnerable. So by 1980, there's a number of murders of young children that's really, you know, terrifying the city. And all of a sudden, you have this major explosion at the Bowen Homes. Now, the community, all they can see is that there's rumors that some white men were there. They were working around the, you know, the, the nearby the, the place where, you know, the, 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 the Bowen Homes blew up. So all the community can think is that we're being, all of a sudden, we're being overwhelmed by these murders. And these white people are actually doing the murders. And they're terrified. They're on the verge of complete chaos. Maynard Jackson, who is, you know, usually pretty good at keeping an audience under his spell, he goes there and he's trying to calm this, this group of people who are upset, who are angry. Four children have been killed, you know, and all he can do is, you know, try to keep them calm, which was very difficult. And you, as you saw in that meeting, they were ready to explode. They felt that Maynard Jackson, that the police department weren't doing enough and this city was right ready to explode. That's what led to them, at net, you know, forming their bat patrols, where the community felt if they weren't going to get any satisfaction from Maynard Jackson and his law enforcement people, they were going to take matters into their own hands. As you saw, people saw them as vigilantes, they had their bats, they had their guns, and they were out there basically saying, if you come into our community and we don't know who you are, you could be in trouble. And, and we focus on this one young man, Chimaranga Jinga, who was very intense on making sure that the young people in this community were safe and sound. You know, so it was a terrifying time for the community. They had no idea who was committing these murders. You know, people, young people like with Tanya Wilson, you know, Charles Stevens and Aaron White, you know, and Earl Terrell, these young people going missing and people were terrified. They were telling their children, be careful when you go out on the streets. It was really a horrific time. And what's fascinating too is that even if you lived, even if you didn't live in Atlanta, you know, I knew young people who lived in New Jersey or lived in New York City who were black or Af African-American, and they knew about the electric child murders, and they were frightened, you know, because as Brenda Muhammad says, you know, there was a monster out there. And they didn't know who that monster was. With the Bowen Holmes bombing, you know, we had uh, several people who said, they saw something or they heard that there was people uh, in a pickup truck who drove in, um, white people who stopped there and had never been there before. What were they doing there early in the morning? And then later that morning, there's a huge explosion. And the community felt like the administration, everybody kind of rushed to say, oh, it was a boiler explosion. And we don't really know for sure. But the fact that there was this kind of rush to say, don't, nothing to see here. This was just an accident. People felt like, wait, you know, they really are, are going to do and say what they want. Our concerns, our fears don't really register. And so you had the bat patrols come out of that. And right away, um, it became, you know, parents protecting their neighborhoods because they felt the police were just not showing up, not interested. And they quickly got labeled vigilantes and a threat to public uh, safety. And here in the midst of an epidemic of children being snatched off the streets, you have 
uh, you know, men being arrested for, you know, basically trying to provide a level of security that they were not getting from the police at that time. And I think that's really a powerful illustration of when, you know, these sort of systems start to break down and they don't work for people. Joshua Bennett, co-director of HBO's Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children, and executive vice president of Showa Force Media, talks about the early inspiration for the new docuseries and why the story needed to be told in a different, more honest way. And my friend Sam Pollard had his film about Maynard Jackson. There's, there was about a five minute sequence on the Atlanta child murders and how that really transformed Maynard Jackson's whole uh, term in office and the trajectory of everything he was doing as the first African-American mayor of a major city. Uh, and after the film, you know, I, I went and had a drink with Sam and I just was struck by how big of a story this was and how it had just these, you know, repercussions that we're still wrestling with today. Racism, inequality, a lack of really an effective justice system for poor uh, persons of color in this country. And I started talking to Sam and I said, you know, this is really a story we should dive into. And I, you know, I remember as a kid, you were here like it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your child is? And I had kind of heard about, oh, yeah, in Atlanta, all these kids had been killed. It kind of came up as I was like a little kid in the 80s and I had a vague recollection of it. But you know, after I started researching it, I just was really just caught up in how big of a story this is, how horrific a story, how so many families still never got justice and how there was still so many unanswered questions. And it just was kind of like peeling away layers of an onion as the more and more you read, it was outrageous that, that really there was never justice in this story. And so um, that really was the inspiration to then say, okay, uh, we should take a deep look at this in a way that, you know, really hasn't in terms of the stuff I've seen on, on how the story's been covered. The series brings into major question whether or not Wayne Williams received a fair trial and highlights the major shortcomings of the evidence that was used to convict him of two murders, namely fiber and hair evidence that most modern day forensic experts would categorize as junk science. You know, I, I sort of really uh, was sitting with this for months, developing it, researching it. And then we actually, um, in the team of Show of Force, we met with Lock Nation and they really you know, saw the potential in the series and, and agreed to work with us. And then, you know, we worked with HBO, Show Force and Sam, we all have worked with HBO in the past, and uh, they were really excited about the way we were going to approach the story in this big dive into this period in Atlanta and telling this bigger story about racism and justice uh, as well. And, um, you know, that then launched us into uh, really developing out what the different episodes would be. And so, you know, Sam, uh, Jeff Dupre, Maro Chimaev, myself, and our series producer, Sarah Lee Weinfeld, we really worked closely together thinking, how can we tell this story episodically? How can we bring this big story of Atlanta in the 1970s and all of the change that was happening with Maynard Jackson, and then the story of all of these horrific murders and the task force and the FBI becoming involved and this becoming a mega national issue. I think that's one of the things that when you watch the series, you realize like this was like a big deal. This was like OJ before OJ. The whole country and the world was obsessed with this story. And so how do we track all of that? So we really work together to create a full series treatment. And then we sort of divided and conquered because we were on a relatively tight schedule. Uh, you know, and HBO wanted to premiere this in 2020. This was in 2019. So we had a pretty record pace for a series of this scope uh, to do it in a little over a year and a few months from when we were greenlit. And so um, because I had already kind of done so much work, I decided I, I would focus on the episodes that were uh, focused on the trial of Wayne Williams and the appeals. And those are episode three and four. Um, and. Uh, on episode four, Jeff Dupre worked with me on the trial and the immediate appeals. Um, and I think that was in part just because uh, the volume of material is just so vast when you start to look at this. It really gives you a window into the legal system because you realize, you know, to mount a, a defense, there are literally boxes of documents that somebody has to go through, somebody has to, to read, and all these witness statements and all of this, uh, you know, different pieces of evidence here and there. And so the level of having to dive into this research, you know, if you're paying lawyers to do that, that's a real expensive proposition. Um, so to me, that was something that, you know, Really, when you looked at it, I said, huh, you know, that's something in our legal system we don't talk about, you know, the access to a fair trial. And in the film, you know, Wayne says, you know, at one point, uh, you know, my family had five thousand dollars to defend this case. And meanwhile, city of Atlanta, the FBI, the federal government even was putting millions of dollars into the prosecution. So that right there is, is kind of alarm bells go off when we talk about a fair legal system in America. Uh, it's outside of the reach of many, many people. 23-year-old Wayne Williams suddenly found himself at the center of a world media storm and might well have become the most hated man in America overnight. But instead of maintaining his silence or preparing for his eventual trial, Williams reveled in the attention he had so desperately sought as a young aspiring talent manager, and he wasn't letting the camera time go to waste. After his initial questioning, Williams scheduled his own faceless press conference with the media from the comfort of his parents' living room before he was ever arrested and used the spotlight to promote his newest endeavor, the second coming of the Jackson 5, a youthful singing boy band called Gemini. I'm a performing arts manager, and these are just some of the contracts we use in the business. It's our job to take some entertainers, say, basically from the street, polishing them up, get them professional, and try and shop a record deal for them. What we're trying to do is just capture the marketplace, basically, that Jackson 5 had. I, I've had probably, uh, you know, at this point, dozens of conversations with Wayne. Um, you know, Wayne 
is uh, just a very peculiar, uh, fascinating person. I mean, here's a young man who did these incredible things as a teenager. He started his own radio station and brought in a whole line of civil rights leaders, you know, people like Julian Bonds or um, Tyrone Brooks was there, uh, Ralph David Abernathy, like big names came into this kid's home where he had his own radio station he built. And you know, here he is running around becoming a freelance you know, journalist, shooting video and selling it to networks. He was really enterprising. And here was a kid, I think, who was hustling to try to find, all right, how am I gonna get ahead down here? Cause it's now or never, I gotta do it. I, I wanna be something. And you really felt talking to him, like here's a guy who, is very intelligent, very, you know, very thoughtful, um, but also, you know, I think his own worst enemy to a degree. I think that Wayne couldn't, uh, he couldn't help himself when you look at the story and look at what happened. He was, he was so interested in that public eye. He was so interested in presenting himself as this person of interest that he kind of walked into the situation and he kind of, you know, basically gave the task force, hey, this, this guy's the perfect suspect. He won't shut up. Um, and I think that was the experience with Wayne. You start to talk with him. And he just kind of goes and goes and kind of keeps going. And there's so much that he wants to kind of cover. But, you know, he sometimes loses his thread and he sometimes changes the detail here or there. And then you start to doubt and you start to question, well, what really happened, Wayne? Or what are you really saying? I think it's it's the kind of thing where, um, you know, one of the persons we interviewed, I won't say his name, you know, said, well, did Wayne kill anybody? I don't know. Is Wayne a pathological liar? Yes. Is Wayne uh, his own worst enemy? Yes. Um, and I think that that was sort of the feeling, like, he really kind of dug his own hole. And as you look at it more and more, there's so many things that come up that clearly demonstrate they needed to get somebody. Wayne was a convenient patsy. Uh, let's make the evidence fit. Let's make the, the hair and fiber evidence just kind of fit to this guy. Uh, we need to close this up. You, you really kind of get that's kind of the force and the FBI is pushing that behind the scenes. But then you also see like, here's a guy who's going around giving flyers out looking for teenage boys to join his band at a point when kids are going missing. And then he's kind of seen in all these different places where it leads to suspicion. And, and he's, you know, uh, said these things to friends that raise the suspicion. And like you'll see in episodes four and five, some things come up where it's like, hmm, maybe Wayne knows more than he's ever told us or that he's ever let on. That was sort of kind of the feeling I got. Like, I don't think he killed 28 kids. Um, did he kill one or two? I don't know. Does he maybe know a little bit more than he's ever let on? Quite possibly, yes. And I think that's kind of the mystery here. It's It's not cut and dry. And it's still this layer of, really what happened here in Atlanta that's still never quite been resolved. With this terrifying period in Atlanta's storied history, having been covered so widely by other media outlets, I wanted to know what makes this series different. What information did the filmmakers have access to that others didn't? What did they find? And perhaps most importantly, did it change their minds on whether or not Wayne Williams was the Atlanta monster everyone thought he was? Or if the city of Atlanta, during a highly political time of economic advancement, took shortcuts in their investigation, deprioritizing the victims and their families over the continued development of the New South? I think when you look at some of the other theories, uh, other treatments of this in the media, I think they kind of really focus on Wayne was on the bridge. We know May 23rd, 1981, there's a big splash. The police come, uh, supposedly there was a splash. And uh, he's, you know, basically condemning himself through talking about a talent meeting and he acts suspicious. And then these suspicious things start to happen. I think what we do is we take all of this together and we connect all the dots. We show the reasons that Wayne was suspicious. We go into his home. We had access through, you know, his lawyer and his legal team that nobody else really had to get all these case files and documents and pieces from Wayne's, you know, personal history too. Uh, and we look at what, um, who he was and what was he really doing. And then we look at how the case was built and we start to really question the evidence in a way that I haven't seen done before, where a lot of people will talk about the fiber evidence and either you believe the fiber evidence or you don't, but you don't really know uh, what some of the problems were in that fiber evidence. But we go to a place where this becomes a much bigger controversy because the things that you'll see start to unfold in four and five with evidence that was buried, investigations that were hidden, uh, and then frankly tampering with evidence at the highest levels um, uh, of law enforcement in this country, we play that thread out and we show, you know, with a couple of whistleblowers too, what was really happening. And I think our, K our series comes to the point where you can believe that Wayne killed people or you can say he's totally innocent, but you can't really say that he got a fair trial and the justice system worked in this case because it didn't. I think we proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt in a way that I haven't seen done before. And I think our conclusion is very different than Mindhunter or some of the other shows that are out there. I think for me, what summed it up, the idea that this community could still be invisible. They could have a child murdered and killed and then the police wouldn't even show up to their door to ask them and interview them about where their child had been. They would just come and drop a notice that the body was found. I think it really spoke in a way to, there was a certain, callousness of, well, it's another kid that, you know, 
was lost from a poor community. Uh, they were being labeled street kids by a lot of people. They were sort of being labeled as, well, disposable kids to a degree. And I think even though that was sort of the last thing that Atlanta wanted to say to the world, I think some of the actions of how the cases were investigated really showed that. This series offers basically a, makes you ask the question, is everything so black and white? Was it so clear that Wayne Wayne was a murderer? If he was the murderer, then you have to question, you know, well, did they convict him on a really, really strong evidence? You know, if he was the murderer, who might have been the murderer? Might have been the Ku Klux Klan? Might have been some pedophiles? Might have been someone in the police department? You know, what happened with the information the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? They accumulated, but they never released until there was the appeals trials. Was, was Wayne a scapegoat? You know, did the city of Atlanta say at the end of two years, the number of murders has become so much, it's so suffocating, we have to find some way to put, bring closure to it. And did Wayne become the perfect scapegoat to do that? I think these raises lots of questions, you know, which none of those other series have done. You know, if you had asked me 18 months ago, Sam, do you think Wayne Williams killed these children? My response would have been one word, yes, Wayne killed these children, you know, and he deserves to be in prison. Now, as we started to do, do our deep dive and investigate, look at the case and look at all the other aspects of the case, and we would, not only me, but the, the team of us would sit around at the production table and we would have constant discussions. Did Wayne do some of the murders? Did Wayne do all the murders? Did he have an accomplice? Was, was he, you know, set up? And I got to tell you that by the time of this whole process, from production, pre-production, to production, to post-production, I came to the conclusion that even though I don't personally think I like Wayne Williams, because I talked to Wayne Williams a few times on the telephone, I don't think he killed anybody. Now, some of the other, my other team members have different re reactions to that, but I don't think he killed anybody. I think he was in the wrong place at the wrong time on that bridge that night. Because when you think about it, when they say, and you saw this in episode three, they heard that splash in the water, right? Now, all of a sudden, how in the world, think about this, how in the world could this guy in his car, even if it was at 10 miles, five miles per hour, jump out of his car, pull a body either out of the trunk or the back seat, which was probably 50 pounds heavier than he was, have the ability to throw it over the bridge, get back in the car without that car being too far away. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. The only thing that doesn't make sense, and this Wayne never really explained it clearly to me in those interviews that we see in the film, he never really explains why was he on that bridge at three in the morning. That never made sense. I also spoke with series co-director and Showa Force media partner, Maro Shermayev, a prolific documentary television series and film producer and director whose list of accomplishments includes contributions to both Emmy and Peabody award-winning features. Marl shared with me the various theories surrounding the mystique of Wayne Williams and how the series relies heavily on the available archival footage from the era to paint a contextual picture of what Wayne Williams represented to a city craving closure in the face of ongoing tragedy. You know, there was an apartment complex extremely near that bridge that we heard about and we heard a lot of people talk about that, you know, was kind of famous for, you know, sort of drugs and swinging and late night parties and, you know, prostitution, both gay and straight prostitution. And the people used to go over to that complex. He was like less than a mile from that place. You know, maybe, you know, was he going to check on a call that he might have at seven in the morning? Maybe not. But, you know, come on. I mean, he, there's so many reasons that he could be out and about. I mean, he, he really was. He really did have a radio and was responding to crime scenes all the time. And he was get, he was out because he wanted to get away from his you know house and his mom and dad. I mean, you know, but Wayne was an owl. So, you know, no, he didn't kill them all. Did he kill nobody? I'm not sure. But I certainly know that. He was a kid who wanted attention. He was 23. He was trying to create the new, the new Jackson 5. He was, you know, his dad was a, you know, everyone talks about how he was like a cop chaser and he was driving after the police. Okay, but that's what his father did. How many people do what your father did? His father was the photographer for the newspaper going to crime scenes, going to fires, going to these things and taking photographs for the paper. So lo and behold, what happens? That's what his son starts doing when he wants to make a buck or two. Oh, and it evolves. He doesn't just do photography. He can do video because he's technically, you know, because, you know, the technology is changing. He was a 23 year old guy. He could not drive over a bridge without a vehicle stopping and throw over a bridge someone who weighed 50 plus pounds more than he did. That's just, I mean, just sh sh do that demo for me. I'd love to see it. It's not possible. And then, by the way, the body that they find two days later is, by any stretch of the imagination, been in the water for four or five days. And people, even in 1979, 80, they knew what a body uh, decomposition was. That wasn't an unknown technology. That body of Nathaniel Cater was not two days in the water. So, so not only that, and not only that, they hear a splash, or they say they hear a splash, or they report a splash, right? In the summer, in the Chattahoochee, which is only a 10 foot deep river. So you're there to hear a splash. You're there to see something being dumped. Okay, you've got lights. You don't see Nathaniel Cater's body 10 feet away. I mean, it, it's, we're, not, we're not talking about like, you know, it went over Niagara Falls and oh my God, where did that go? How quickly would you find that body if he dumped it? And it was there in a river that was that, that moves at a glacial pace 
flash your lights down in the water, people. If you if you dumped a big bag of garbage and if you dumped a big guy, he'd be right there for hours before he would end up a mile down river. According to them, it took him two two hours to you know two days or whatever to go a mile down river. And by the way, if you kill someone in your house where your two parents live, your two former school teacher parents, how is it that you would have fibers from your bedspread, fibers from the carpet, fiber all over the bodies, but nothing in the house of any of the victims no fibers in wayne's house of any of the victims seems unlikely I, I to me it's like all these things can have one explanation and then they can have another explanation but the reality that is without question to me is that wayne williams did not get a fair trial now if he had had a really fair trial and they had had to prove that case and did not create a bunch of you know bunkum junk science you know fibers he would never get convicted today for any of this it said he didn't he also didn't have any money he didn't have any money, and he and the and the and the city and the issues were shut down. This case, this city needs to grow, and it's not going to grow. And no one's going to come here and bring their conventions down here. And Coca Cola is going to pick up and pull out of its roots if we are just if we maintain being a murder capital that can't solve a crime. You know, uh, you know, as as Camille Bell says, you know, if the Atlanta Police Department couldn't catch a cold, then why are people going to go and live there? And you know. Well, I think in this case, we, we determined very early on that the archival opportunities, the footage that was actually filmed at the time 40 years ago, was an enormous, enormous pool of um, opportunity for us because, you know, CNN was just, you know, starting in, in late 70s, really officially 1980, you know, right, right there in Atlanta. We were, you know, it was a, this, was, this was a major breaking news story. This is one of the first crimes that actually ever used the term serial killer. It, 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 it launched the, the, the tagline, you know, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your children are? This was a huge, huge case. And it was a series of crimes going on and on and on. The news were very involved. The local news, it became a, a U.S. story. It became an international story. It, be, it moved from being a local story to being, you know, the FBI getting involved. So it was a big story. And as a result, there were a lot of people filming. And when we started to see that all the searches were filmed, all the funerals were filmed, all the, you know, we began to look at that. We thought, you know what, we can, we can make an unfolding drama here that takes you back in time 40 years ago. You're not gonna feel like that that footage from the past is a B-roll or a punctuation to something that's like a talking head. You're gonna be able to go back in time with this story and retell it with the archive. We were finding things that people had never seen before, just didn't have the resources to do. And we were, we were really creating a new story that while very old feels like it's happening right now. And then of course we were able to interview some 50 plus people, whether those are survivors, whether journalists, things that were going on that police, um, you know, local historians, we were really able to bring um, their dialogue, their kind of Greek chorus into play while actually reliving the footage in the past instead of recreating it. With so many questions surrounding the presumed guilt of Wayne Williams and his eventual conviction of two adult murders, I wanted to know from Maro Shermayev's perspective what they heard from the families they interviewed for the series and what Wayne Williams' conviction and the subsequent closing of 10 additional cases that were investigatively related to the Atlanta child murders meant to those whose children were still missing or dead and whose cases still, to this day, have never been appropriately investigated or solved. Is that sort of open wound that's still in Atlanta because of the race and the poverty um, divisions that still ring true, but for parents and siblings, especially, who are sort of coming of age now in their 50s, you know, maybe they were 10 years old when their sibling was killed, who never had any closure, never had any form of justice in their mind because Wayne Williams, the, the perpetrator that was ultimately, you know, uh, you know, now serving time in prison, was actually only accused of, of, of murdering two adults. And there were all of these children that preceded the adults. And they then sort of brought these cases in as like or similar cases. But they actually never tried them. They, ne they actually never went through the full investigative um, force of looking into those crimes. You know, they never completed the solid police work. They never solved those crimes. And they're 29 of them. So so for the families, they felt like, well, you know, wait a minute, like they, they've got these two adults, but this has nothing to do with our kids. And, um, and that feeling of being pushed aside and not having your child's case really, really investigated was very, very painful and just as raw today as it was 40 years ago. And so that pain is really etched on the, on the faces of the family members. And you see it and you hear it. And um, we really wanted to spend a lot of our time um, you know, not, not focusing or, or making the, the series from their perspective, but honoring their concerns and giving them a voice in this process, uh, in this series. 
The directors of Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children, brilliantly captured the voices of some of the survivors, the very mothers, brothers, and sisters of those children who were brutally murdered. Their bodies mangled, abused, and dumped in places where it took officials weeks or months to discover them. I wanted to know how these filmmakers approached the families while exploring some potentially horrific and at times traumatizing crime scenes. In terms of the mothers, um, I felt really connected to the mothers, of course. And I, I think that, um, you know, maybe I connected as a mother, um, you know, Sam is African-American. Um, I am a, you know, a white woman, you know, so everybody had their, their connective place. Um, and I think that that was an interesting thing that they sort of could relate to each of us in different ways when they had to um, and when they wanted to. But to me, I felt, I felt like I really wanted to, to dig more deeply into, into that sort of emotional fabric of, of, of what it was like to lose your child. And I think that that's the takeaway that, you know, my, my partner in show force, Jeff Dupre, who's also a director on the series and directed episode uh, five. And that was one of the things that we talked about a lot, which everyone says, oh, the closure, closure, closure. But really, what closure is there if your child is murdered? It, and even if you find out, you know, maybe beyond a reasonable doubt that it was this person, it still doesn't bring you back your child or, or in any way express the fact that, you're, you know, that your child never got to, to, to grow up and have children and make their own mistakes and figure out their own way. It's, it's, it's a, you know, they've been robbed. Because it was, you know, it's one of these, other again, one of these long dialogues we would have constantly about how long should we have these images on the screen, you know, was it too painful to show to some of the family members? We knew it would be, you know, but we felt that it was important that the family members and the audience, the viewing audience see, you know, what was done to these poor children, you know, that they got a real sense of it. And it was, it wasn't a difficult, it was a difficult choice to figure out which ones to use, how long to use them. But we tried to be, I, I can't use the word tasteful, we tried to be not overly, overly, um, and sensitive to, to what they might go through. But it's still going to be painful for some of them. I know we've heard from some of the family members that it was painful to see some of those images. You know, I think part of it is you have to, you have to approach material and people <laughs> with a lot of sensitivity and understanding. And you really have to listen. You know, it's not just about talking or getting that little sound bite that you want to get. It's about being in a conversation and entering into a relationship with someone so that they are really sharing their truth and their, and their sort of sorrows with them. So I think we've all had those um, experiences as film directors. So we, you know, we've, we came to it with a lot of with a lot of respect for the process and a lot of respect for the people. And I think you really have to have that. You know, crime scenes where that body of that child may have been there for three, four months, five months, a year in the woods with animals. Um, you know, and like all of those things are just so distressing when you're thinking about it being, you know, the you know the body of a loved one. But a lot of things happen, and then in your mind it becomes this much more sinister or conspiratorial thing. But I think in some cases. Uh, some of the things are quite explainable as to what might have happened in that way. Not how did they get there, not who, who, who did this to them, but, what, but what, what sort of happened along the way. And you do remember things. I mean, Earl, Earl um, um, Anthony Terrell talked to us about seeing, you know, his brother's body in his bathing suit with just bones. I was completely, and no such photograph exists to my knowledge, that that, that was in fact, um, the, you know, the way that... that um, uh, Earl Terrell's body was found, but in his mind, it's just—I mean—he can see that picture. So you have to—you have to sort of—you um, have to weed through some of that, but you also have to let people have the ideas and the thoughts that they have. Um, and you know, if that's his truth, I want him to be able to share that truth. Forty years is a very, very long time. But for the families of those children who went missing or were murdered in Atlanta, it likely feels like just yesterday. Those old wounds are still fresh, still bleeding, until justice is brought to the nearly 30 families still waiting and wondering what might eventually come of the mayor's decision to reopen the cases 40 long years later in 2019. But the question in reinvestigations 40 years later, where obviously we have DNA, we have other resources that, and technologies to address um, investigation and techniques of investigation, but, but what do they really have anymore? And also, the way that they gathered the evidence at the time was completely flawed. The crime scenes were a mess. The crime scenes were, um, you know, people were smoking and dogs were walking around and they were tra traipsing all over stuff. And how were they collecting the materials? I mean, there was one point where the, um, the attorney for Wayne Williams um, said that she was taken, you know, as, a, as the defense by the prosecution to see some of the, the clothing and the items and things that had been gathered uh, as evidence. And they were all thrown together on one table when she was looking at them. And she said, well, how can... How can you be talking about a case put together between about with, with fibers and hairs if I'm looking at all this evidence that's been so? There's, the question is, what does she have? But I think the intention 
of the mayor and of Erica Shields, the chief of police. I think it, I think that intention is not to exonerate like Wayne Williams or to open up. I, I think it's really to honor the parents. I mean, I think the memorial and that 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 piece of the pie that they're going to have a memorial for the families um, is very important to the families. And I think you know I think that there that will happen. But the the more sort of significant element, which is the cases is a question, but the cases were never investigated one by one. So even if you just begin to look at, re-look at who are the suspects and what was happening in the investigations of each case, not treating them as if they are 29 or 30 killings done by one individual. That is almost, in my mind, 100% impossible. I could tell you three cases on that list that in my personal opinion, after a lot of research, weren't murders at all. I think that one of the children fell out of a off of the overpass through a tree. I think uh, one of them was killed by family members quite clearly. I think that one of them drowned and was not in fact even a murder victim. So this list almost became this political thing. You know, it became this, you know, you wanted to get on the list because you wanted more attention and there was a lot of money flying in the air. All these things were, were making these kind of um, ch- sort of obsessions that were not really about just getting down as Monica Kaufman, the, um, the WSB anchor said, you know, do the police work, solve the cases. And I think when they do that, and I think they may well do that, um, several of the cases will be removed as being official cases uh, attributed to a single Atlanta child killer, AKA Wayne Williams. They won't, they'll, they'll come off. And I think that they've even admitted uh, to us, you know, on the record that they believe that the crimes of the, the murders of the two girls that are on the list will come off the list. You know, this was, this was targeting, but in truth, targeting is always done to the most vulnerable. When you look at, and so if you look after Wayne Williams was arrested and the, and the sort of the shift had taken place between children being murdered to um, adults or young adults being murdered, were young adult black males murdered after Wayne was arrested? Yes, they were. Was there a series of strings of small children? No. The best outcome is that in reopening some of the cold cases, maybe they will find out who killed two of those, those young ladies, Latanya Wilson and Angel Lanier. You know, maybe they'll find out who killed those girls. I don't think they'll ever find out who killed some of the other people that were murdered at that time that's attached to Wayne. You know, I also think that Wayne Williams will never get out of jail. I mean, I just don't think that no one will ever give him some kind of pardon or release, you know. And I think that symbolically that when the mayor, I think they're creating some kind of visual monument for these young, these children, these deceased children. I think that will give a sense of peace, to some sense of peace to the family members. I think she's. I think it is a symbolic gesture. Basically, give these families, these mothers, these siblings, some sense of closure that the city still cares and remembers what they had to go through, the ordeals they had to confront. I think it's also an opportunity for her to be able to to reopen some of these cold cases that have never never been resolved. Now, I don't think that by reopening some of these cold cases that they will ever 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 let Wayne Williams out of jail. I don't think the city can do that. I think the city would have to if they had released Wayne Williams, they would have to admit they made a mistake. And I don't think they're going to do that at all. I think the the Atlanta Police Department. You know, not the chief, but the rest of the Atlanta Police Department would be up in arms. <laughs> and a lot of those retired police detectives who were in the film, they would all be up in arms. The first three parts of Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children, are already available on HBO. Parts 4 and 5 come out Sunday at 7.45 p.m., this weekend and next, respectively. I want to give a special thanks to directors Sam Pollard, Joshua Bennett, and Maro Shamaya for honoring me with their time and perspective, and for sharing with our fans a behind-the-scenes look at this incredibly important and groundbreaking docuseries. Thanks also to HBO for allowing me to screen the series pre-release, and to Kat Barnett for bringing everyone together on such short notice. Until next time, be well and look out for one another. And I can't stand here today and not call their names. They were Edward Smith, age 14, Alfred Evans, age 13, Milton Harvey, age 14, Yusuf Bell, age 9, Angel Lanier, age 12, Jeffrey Mathis, age 10, Eric Middlebrooks, age 14, Chris Richardson, age 12, Latanya Wilson, age 7, Anthony Carter, age 9, Earl Terrell, age 10, Clifford Jones, 13, Darren Glass, 10, Charles Stevens, 12, Aaron Jackson, 9, Patrick Rogers, 16, Luby Jeter, 14, Terry Pugh, 15, Patrick Baldazar, 11, Curtis Walker, 15, Joseph Bell, 15, Timothy Hill, 13, William Barrett, 17, adults Eddie Duncan, 21, Larry Rogers, 20, Michael McIntosh, 23, Jimmy Ray Payne, 21, John Porter, 28, Nathaniel Carter, 27.
Do you love true crime? Do you love the 90s? Well, I've got a brand new true crime podcast for you called 90s Crime Time. I'm your host, Simone, and on this show, you'll hear cases from theft to kidnapping to murder, all from this great decade of 1990 to 1999. Unlike the O.J. Simpson trial, the Columbine High School massacre, and the Oklahoma City bombing, on this show, I'd like to focus on lesser-known 90s crime cases that did not make much, if any, national news. You'll hear cases such as the murder of Sharice Iverson, the death of Tommy Burke, the Stardust casino robbery, the murder of Diane Nash, and others. On 90s Crime Time, you're more than likely going to be amazed at just how many violent crimes occurred during this time period. Scorned lovers, serial killers, and baby killers were just some of the types of murderers that committed grisly crimes throughout the 90s. I will warn you, some of these crimes I will talk about may make you sad, angry, or maybe even a little scared. Listener discretion is always advised, and I hope that you'll tune in every Wednesday and Thursday for a brand new episode of 90s Crime Time. You can find 90s Crime Time on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. You can also find 90s Crime Time on social media apps such as Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. I'd love for you to take a listen, maybe follow, and maybe leave a rating or two. Don't forget to tell your friends and family about 90s Crime Time, and I'll see you soon on the show.